Welcome to Geology Talk, our monthly gathering of geology enthusiasts. I have a great panel today. Andrew Dunning and Emma Rahalski is back, and Gary Gordon and myself. And our speaker is uh, mineralogist Julian Gray, who will be talking about the mineralogy of Georgia. And now, Andrew Dunning with the Geology News. All right, thanks, Paul. Good morning, everybody. This is the Geology News for March 2023. My name is Andrew Dunning. I am a just about done graduate student, master's student at uh, Portland State University. I am an earthquake geologist. So I tend to start these geology news moments with the month's earthquakes. The biggest event of the last month was a magnitude 7.0 north of New Zealand in the Kermadec Islands right here. This is an aftershock, most likely, of the December 2021 uh, earthquake sequence, which was uh, included a magnitude 8.0 megathrust earthquake, which is a subduction zone earthquake, the largest types of earthquakes in the world. There was a very minor 10 centimeter tsunami measured on an island about 100 miles away. So overall, not many people felt or even knew this earthquake happened. In contrast, there were a couple of major earthquakes around the world that were a little less friendly. Uh, a magnitude 6.9 near Guayaquil, Ecuador, which is this one right here. This is a 65 kilometer deep earthquake, uh, which is common for this part of South America, oddly enough. Uh, so it's taking place below that subduction zone in the uppermost mantle. Uh, there's a lot of liquefaction from this really intense local shaking and uh, heavy building damage. There were about 15 fatalities and at least 490 injured. Hey, Andrew, before you move to the next slide, uh, I'm curious about this aftershock in New Zealand. That's like, been almost a year, a little bit more than a year. I didn't realize that aftershocks happened that long after the original event. How do we like, how long can an aftershock happen after the event and how do we relate the two? Well, just a couple of months ago, there was an aftershock of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in northern Japan. So with these subduction zone earthquakes, aftershocks can happen for decades because of just the amount of rock that is uh, affected. Such okay. a huge geographic area. So they have like just the same epicenter, but a lower magnitude? The same area, yeah. Oh, okay. There was also a magnitude 6.5 earthquake in Afghanistan on the plate boundary between Eurasia and India. This was a very deep earthquake over 187 kilometers. So that's at the very base of the crust. This is the thickest continental crust in the world in this area underneath the Himalaya. Um, and this earthquake was felt over a pretty wide area. There was significant damage in northern Afghanistan and Pakistan with about 13 known fatalities. Very unfortunate there. Here in the United so let me, States. Let me yeah. ask you again about the aftershocks. Yeah. How does one distinguish between a, an aftershock and the actual event, especially when the aftershock can occur more than a year after the event? If it happens in the same area and it is smaller than the first earthquake, it's an aftershock. They, uh, the pattern of aftershocks after an earthquake decays, I think, I think logarithmically over time. It's some kind of function like that. Uh, so you can follow this curve for decades in some cases. Here in the United States, this is all of the earthquakes in March, larger than magnitude one. Largest was a 4.6 near Ferndale, California, where there was a magnitude six point something or other in December of 2022. Uh, that's an aftershock as well. Uh, it was felt by a number of people I know up in that area. There was a magnitude 4.1 over here in Texas related to ongoing oil and gas extraction in this area. And up in the Northwest, there was a magnitude 3.1 below Richland, Oregon, which is just over here at the south end of the Wallowa Mountains, felt by a number of people in the area. And uh, I always enjoy seeing about earthquakes in Oregon because we don't tend to get very many. And speaking of which, there is a magnitude 1.8 below Scapoose, which is just to the northern end of the Portland metropolitan area. So very small, definitely nobody felt that. 
what else is going on? We have some micro seismicity going on in the uh, uh, the Wasatch Front here, which goes through uh, Utah, and some micro seismicity along the San Andreas Fault in the Eastern California Shear Zone, and out here in the Oklahoma oil fields. And that's this is all normal, nothing too spectacular seismicity for the United States. We move on to volcanics. There are 28 currently erupting or new volcanic eruptions going on around the world. There's been substantial volcanic activity at Stromboli here in the Mediterranean. Some impressive, uh, well, not very impressive, some small lava flows and impressive lava fountains have been coming out of there. Stromboli is one of the most active volcanoes in the world and erupts pretty much continuously for at least the last several thousand years. The Kilauea eruption uh, ended again. It has been sort of on a off and off, on and off again schedule. Um, but it seems like this time the eruption is over for good. The summit inflation, which reflects how much magma is being supplied to the volcano, has stopped. And uh, volcanic gas emissions have also dramatically decreased. So Kilauea is probably going to be quiet for a little while. And last month I mentioned a uh, ongoing seismic swarm at Trident Volcano in Alaska, one of the larger volcanic complexes in, uh, in the Americas. And uh, there's been nearly no change there. There's still occasional earthquakes um, and no sign of imminent volcanic activity. We move into some interesting research items that have come out in the last month. This one is uh, relevant to my field. So uh, fault healing is my sort of short summary title about it. Uh, these researchers in New Zealand uh, did a whole bunch of rock cores in, around, and through the subduction zone off the coast of northern New Zealand. And uh, these rock cores actually have the rocks that make up the fault contact. Uh, so in the middle of these cores is the fault plane. And so they can take those rock samples and squish them in the lab, put them under extreme pressure, uh, the same pressure they would be experiencing down here at this depth of the crust. And they can analyze how much pressure it takes before the rocks slip in an earthquake, a simulated earthquake, and what happens to these rock grains after the earthquake happened. And they found out in this area that uh, a lot of these rock cores, the fault planes rehealed, the mineral grains regrew after the earthquake happened, because during earthquakes, there's a lot of heat and fric uh, from friction because of the amount of rock grinding past itself. And uh, in that sort of residual heat, mineral grains will start to regrow. And in clay rich rocks, like up here in the accretionary wedge of the subduction zone, uh, faults in this area they found are more likely to move slowly and without rupture as an earthquake uh, because these clay minerals are tend to be kind of big and planar and on a molecular scale and uh, because of that they're a little bit more slippery they don't have as big of a frictional threshold before they create an earthquake and crystalline rocks down here on the subduction zone interface are much more likely to rupture as large earthquakes because crystals sort of get stuck on themselves and tend not to uh, heal quite like the clay rich rocks do. So this is interesting and important insight into fault behavior. This is not the kind of thing that allows us to predict earthquakes, but it is uh, important in understanding just how large earthquakes and faults behave at depth. As long as we're on faults and subduction zones, the one, the Juan de Fuca plate off, off the coast of Washington, Oregon, it seems to me, I, I, I've been very curious about how far east we go, say, say like the big one happens, right? And how far east do you go to, to where it dissipates down to nothing? And I've also noticed that it seems like maybe Seattle, if the big one hits, Seattle might be hit a little harder than Portland. Maybe we're further from the coast than Seattle. Uh, but then, and the secondary question is, traveling east from Portland, if the big one hits, will, will say the Mount Hood area still be affected or will, will it have dropped off so much that there won't be much damage that far east? So that depends entirely on what you mean by the big one. 
well, about you know, a dozen every, different one every ones that could happen. The, the one that on average happens every three or 400 years. Well, that's only the southern hundred or so miles of the Cascadia subduction zone. So we would not be, well, I mean, it'll be, that would be still a mess, but they would not be affected up by that up in Seattle necessarily. If you're talking about a wall to wall Canada, California rupture, um, uh, you know, pretty much the most heavily affected area will be everything east of the Cascade, or everything west of the Cascades. Andrew, could you clarify on, on what you're talking about with this healing? Does the rock just, is there no visible structure of the fault anymore after this happens? Does it leave uh, any so texture? The fault is just a plane. It's just the contact between two rocks. And right at that fault plane, uh, it tends to be really slick. It's uh, sort of ground smooth by this repeated earthquake action. And in clay rich rocks, those clay minerals regrow. Mm -hmm. They they regrow into their planar shape, which uh, is has a lot less frictional capacity. Um, so instead of creating a big earthquake, it's more likely to just sort of creep next to itself. And we see that in California on the San Andreas Fault, uh, sort of between the Bay Area and uh, about the transverse ranges in the Southern California, uh, the San Andreas Fault creeps through there, just ticks slowly along constantly. Uh, and that is because at depth, the rocks are serpentinite and serpentine and uh, other sort of clay and mud originated rocks. And just the types of minerals in there allow, ooh, excuse me, allow the fault to just slide because they're slippery. Uh, whereas in things like the subduction zone or other parts of the San Andreas Fault, uh, you don't get that. The rocks are much um, harder, more crystalline, a, a bit grippier next to each other on the fault interface. I wish I had, was better versed. I know we've got a lot of Tai, tai Florinor, Siletz River Volcanics, which I know are really heavy in clays. So I wonder, this is fascinating research. So I'm wondering if that puts our risk a little bit less in terms be, because we have maybe more clays along that subduction zone plane uh, just off the coast here as opposed to crystalline that might be a little further north of us up up closer to seattle just just a thought and, and you don't have to answer it was just something that ran through my head a little bit um i do know that the subduction interface here is dominantly uh, crystalline rocks. Of the uh, intrusive rocks that formed the Silence River Volcanics and the Yahats Volcanics and the Tolomoc Volcanics, this is the bottom of those, which is all crunchy and crystalline and makes large earthquakes. They can't all be winners. All right, this, is, this was my favorite thing I saw this month. Uh, you may know that underneath the Antarctic ice sheet, there are lakes, liquid water lakes under thousands of feet of ice between the bottom of the ice and the surface of the Antarctic rock. And these are some of the most difficult, inaccessible parts of anything anywhere on the planet. And these researchers have been studying a whole bunch of these in the West Antarctic ice sheet. And over the few years they've been studying them, they found out that a lot of these lakes fill and empty episodically, and that water goes between them. It flows between them along the gravitational course of the ice sheet. And these guys have been drilling down into the ice sheet, sorry, these researchers, I should say, have been drilling down into the ice sheet to a couple of the more accessible subglacial lakes. And they found, they retrieved for the first time sediment cores from the bottom of these subglacial lakes. So it's 3,600 feet under the surface. That's how much ice is there. Then there's about uh, 30 feet of water. And then there's a whole bunch of sediment that they got sediment cores out of. And studying the sediments in here, the microfossils of bacteria and foraminifera and other organisms and the oxygen carbon isotopes within is going to tell them a basically a climatic and biological history of this isolated body of water. And the fact that uh, 
and it was these microfossils that allowed them to determine that these subglacial lakes are hydrologically linked. Water can move between them because they found the same species of, you know, basically endemic bacteria and uh, other microorganisms <clears throat> between multiple lakes. That's just fascinating stuff. And I included this video of what it's like to oh, get rid of the sound. This is what it's like going down into the ice sheet. This is just under a minute long. So this is the top of the ice core. They have this uh, ultraviolet light around the drill string uh, to decontaminate all of the equipment so they don't introduce any uh, you know, surface bacteria into the isolated subglacial lake environment. This is the surface of the water table. And that's what the inside of an Antarctic subglacial lake looks like. All of these floating things are microorganisms that uh, basically evolved largely isolated from the surface world. This is the bottom of the Antarctic ice sheet. And the floor of it, uh, this is looks like rock flour and other pieces of sort of glacial gravel and rocks. Absolutely amazing stuff. I'm a big fan of Antarctic geology. Yeah, I'm curious, do you have any idea of why these lakes form? Like I'm trying to imagine a lake underneath a glacier, like how that even happens. Some of them, <clears throat> excuse me, some of them like uh, Lake Vostok, which is one of the largest, it is the largest, actually predates the ice in Antarctica. <clears throat> so some of these do, some of them just fill, uh, you know, crustal void spaces. Um, and when you get that much ice on top of it, everything underneath it is under pressure. So you can get compressed uh, the water underneath the glaciers. There's always water at the base of the glacier. Um, and but here, that sort of basal water is trapped in a little depression and is basically isolated as a lake. Is that just because of the amount of pressure that it's under that like forces it to be in a different phase? basically mostly in the pressure it's not in a not quite in a different phase um mm. and it is above freezing uh so some of it is water that sort of seeps down from the top through that's, 36 that's feet of ice very cool all right and one final piece of interesting new research there is a fossil locality in the Hudspeth Shale in uh, central Oregon near Mitchell, which is where the Painted Hills are, that uh, yields a lot of marine fossils. I've actually been there, uh, you know, sort of incidentally, I was there and I found a couple of cool snail shells, and really not much else. And the age of this rock unit uh, goes to about 110 million years ago, and that's bracketed by the presence of this ammonite here, which is endemic to the Hudspeth Shale. So this and a few other locations allows them to say, okay, this organism existed at this time and it's present in this rock, so the rock is this old. And that's one of the easier ways to date marine rocks to figure out how old those are. Uh, but this is a sort of mudstone, fine sandstone that uh, was deposited in a nearshore continental shelf that did eventually uh, deepen out into a uh, underwater a continental shelf slope break environment where uh, deposition is influenced heavily by underwater landslides. But this is a rare locality in really most fossil beds, this is not common, where both bone and plant materials are preserved. Usually you get one or the other depending on the chemistry of the sediments, um, but you can get both in certain examples like this one where everything is deposited or preserved catastrophically in a landslide or debris flow, whatever. And that's what they discovered in this site. There's a huge amount of plant material. I believe that's what these, yeah, that's what these two are. These are plant fossils. And there's also this bone stuff. So this is ammonite, but these are pterosaurs, underwater dinosaurs. And this is a piece of a jawbone here. And this is a tooth and this is another tooth. And this is a part of a mandible, I think. Uh, but this is uh, a previously, this species of pterosaur was only found in a couple other locations in Oregon. But part of the reason they isolated this one is because there's a huge amount of phosphorus in this 
special fossil bed. And phosphorus comes from waste. So they interpreted this whole site as being a debris flow that carried with it a pterosaur guano nest. <laughs> and uh, that unique soil chemistry allowed all of these different sort of little microcosm of this environment to get preserved <clears throat> in, in the rock record. A pterosaur guano nest. Well, thank you, Andrew. Will you yeah. be able to stick around for a couple minutes uh, after uh, at noon for any Q&A? Yep, that's it. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, Andrew, have you seen the um, the underwater mountain that they found off Cape Mendocino, 3,000 foot peak that looks, <laughs> uh, it's um, the company called Sail Drone found it apparently, and it hasn't been found. It looks like a boot cake, they say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's off Cape Mendocino, so it's kind of a, an interesting area. Yeah. I'll look into that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your question, Leslie. Yeah. Uh, let's go to Julian. Um, when you are ready, Julian is I a ready. Talk yes. member, has given presentations before when he was director of the Rice Museum. And uh, well, Julian, why don't you tell us a little more about yourself, and I'll let you share your screen and, and get started. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm um, uh, retired from the Rice Museum, uh, where I served as executive director and for a while as curator uh, over there. Uh, and before that, uh, I moved here from my home state of Georgia, where I was curator of the Tellus Science Museum, which is a 120,000 square foot uh, museum. I helped design the exhibits there. Uh, I'm a geologist. Uh, my primary focus is, is mineralogy, uh, and I've been collecting since a very early age. So I like to, you know, <clears throat> got into mineralogy. I, I went into the environmental field for a number of years, but uh, eventually uh, gravitated back to my first love, which is minerals. And that uh, landed me the job as curator at Telus Science Museum and eventually led to uh, a project uh, researching the minerals of Georgia that we're gonna talk about today. So uh, in 1978, uh, this man, Bob Cook, uh, now retired uh, professor emeritus at Auburn University, put together the first minerals of Georgia. It was a Georgia Geological Survey Bulletin. And um, it was a great book and highly sought after by mineral collectors uh, looking for sites. Uh, the way that this book was produced was uh, he dictated it to, well, first of all, he did the research. Uh, he camped out at the Georgia Geological Survey uh, in their technical files room and went through all the technical files, gleaned all the data for any mention of any mineral uh, and recorded that for us, uh, which was a great project. Uh, and uh, he produced the book by dictating it to his secretary, who then typed it up. Uh, and um, and uh, with that method, it produced a lot of errors right off the press. Uh, and uh, so uh, over years, Bob had tracked some of the errors. Uh, rock collectors had, uh, had reported the errors. And then we started collecting them. And we finally, uh, in the 1990s, uh, this uh, decided the book needed a, re a revision, and it took us 15 years, but in um, uh, after we finally earnestly started on the project, but in uh, 2016, uh, Bob Cook uh, invited me to help him uh, work on the updated uh, version of the Minerals of Georgia, uh, and Jose Santa Maria, who is the executive director at the Rice, uh, at Tellus Science Museum, uh, served as editor for the book, and he is a well-versed uh, mineral collector as well. So um, so I want to share with you uh, a little bit about uh, just a brief overview of the geology and what it's like uh, doing geology in the southeast, and, uh, and then we'll uh, get into the minerals. Uh, we'll do a little bit of industrial minerals, uh, uh, but then uh, have a lot of eye candy, a lot of specimen minerals, uh, and good photographs by professional 
photography. Hey, Julian, just real yes. quick, uh, I'm curious about this book. Is it essentially just like a guide book, like pictures of minerals and where you can find them in Georgia, or is it more of like uh, describing the geology and why these minerals are there? Good question, Emma. This is uh, this is not a, a book that is um, you know just tells you to drive down this certain road, go a certain distance, and turn here and dig here. It's not a dig here book. Um, and it it does not have maps. Uh, uh, it is more of a, a mineralogy of the state. So it records every occurrence of minerals in the state um, that we had as of sometime in 2015. So it's it's a documentation of the. So it's more scholarly. So um, <clears throat> I do want to uh, talk a little bit about what it's like uh, trying to map or collect in the South. Uh, it's a subtropical environment. When I moved to Portland, people said, you know, how can you live there? It rains all the time. It's like I looked up in the Almanac. It rains three times as much in the southeast as it does here. So that leads to heavily forested, uh, vegetated uh, outcrops. Um, and there's a thing called saprolite. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, a soil forms uh, and any structure in the rock is preserved, but the rock weathers chemically in place. Uh, and so, um, you know, that also is a challenge to mapping. And then uh, there's something else, uh, kudzu, which uh, is an invasive species brought in to control erosion, and it covers everything. You'll see buildings, you know, the shape of a building made entirely out of kudzu. And I don't have a picture of this, but of course, urban sprawl uh, is, uh, is huge as well. So anyway, um, but uh, some the geology has been deciphered largely. Well, we're, we're, uh, we have a lot of that. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we're working in an environment that is formed uh, from largely from the collision of uh, what became Africa with Laurentia, or you know what eventually became North America, formed the ancestral Appalachian Mountains. And so Georgia would be right here under the word central. Uh, and then after that occurred, it, uh, it rifted apart. Uh, and you'll see that there is no coastal plain. Uh, the uh, Appalachian Mountains eroded, shed sediments. During the collision, they shed sediments uh, west uh, into central North America. Uh, after the collision and after the uh, rifting, uh, sediments from North America were shed onto the coastal plain that wraps around all the way up the Mississippi Valley over to Texas. Um, just a quick look uh, at, uh, at the geology. This is a cross section uh, from northwest to southeast. There are a number of island arcs that came in. Uh, they brought in a lot of interesting uh, elements with them, like uh, gold, uh, which Georgia is familiar, uh, famous for, uh, collided, and then there was uh, erosion, and this doesn't, uh, this ends before the rifting. So you'll see the pattern here that is uh, the metamorphic rocks, uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks in the browns and purples here. The purples are, are plutons, uh, granitic uh, rocks, uh, and most of the browns are uh, gneisses and schist uh, in very interesting rocks here in the Carolina slate belt or Carolina terrain uh, here where we had some island arcs that did some interesting things. Uh, Northwest Georgia in uh, the blue here is, is largely folded and faulted sedimentary rocks. You find a lot of fossils there, not a lot of crystalline minerals, but you do find some things, um, calcite, barite, and things like that that we'll talk about. We have to talk about uh, we have to talk about metamorphism though, which is something that we don't see a lot of in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, when you uh, have a collision of mountains, you have sedimentary rocks. They get caught up in the collision, uh, and you uh, the rock types change from slate to phyllite to schist. When you get the schist, you start to grow new minerals, and we're going to talk about that a lot. And then eventually, it'll begin to partially melt. Uh, become uh, uh, foliated in, in, in a nice. Uh, you erode all of this, uh, the mountains off, and then you look at the core of the mountains, and that's what we see in the uh, Appalachians. Uh, 
Uh, this is a map which has the, the uh, age dates that we have, good, um, um, uh, good work here from Thickpen and L uh, last year. Good paper came out. Uh, and they also have overlaid the metamorphic isograds uh, on here. Uh, this is the Smoky Mountain Fault, uh, which is the western boundary of the Blue Ridge. Uh, everything to the west is uh, folded and faulted sedimentary rocks. But as you move from here, from this station, uh, you will see a green line, which is chlorite. Uh, this is the biotite in isograd, so you'll start to see biotite in schist there. This is starlight, so right here you'll start to see starlight, and then, uh, or I'm sorry, garnet, and then starlight. And so in this area, you'll see starlight, and uh, you'll eventually get up to grades that will produce uh, kyanite and silmanite. So that. Hey, Julian, could you yes. just clarify what an ice, um, what metamorphic isograd is? Yes. If you go out and look at the rocks, you find kyanite in all of these rocks here but you don't find it on this side, you draw a line that is a boundary between where you find kyanite and you don't find kyanite. And you find kyanite and you don't find silmanite, but you find silmanite over here. It's okay, where the temperature and pressure conditions that will and chemistry conditions, which will grow that mineral. Okay, so they're kind of like a gradient of metamorphic. Exactly. Conditions, so, okay. So uh, looking at the geologic map, we have uh, the folded and faulted sedimentary rocks of the Valley and Ridge. Uh, the, this is called crystalline. We just some, uh, uh, group it all into crystalline rocks of the Piedmont and Blue Ridge. And the coastal plain, which is unconsolidated sediment, uh, not a lot of interesting minerals there. I just refer to it as overburden. So uh, mining, we won't go into detail here, but mining started in the 1700s with kaolin. Uh, gold was discovered in the early 1800s. I like to remind people from California that the first gold rush occurred in the Southeast. Uh, and other things, they got into metallic uh, things. They've been mining barite, ochre, and umber since the late 1800s up until today. They're still mining that today. <laughs> and uh, today, of course, we have industrial minerals, the usual uh, granite, limestone, and gneiss for aggregate and crushed stones, dimension stones, gra granite and marble, and industrial minerals, ochre, barite, and kaolin. Starting to get into the minerals, uh, I like to start with the state symbols. It's it's kind of, uh, it's a thing that many states do. Our state mineral is starlight, which is one of those metamorphic indicator minerals, uh, but it's a very cool, one of my favorite minerals. Uh, and I have some pictures of more in a minute. Quartz, we have a lot of quartz in the state and it's gem quality. So that is our state gem. We have a, a fossil, the shark's tooth uh, found in the coastal plain, uh, but we don't have a state rock. And the reason for that is uh, when they started to build the state capitol building, they didn't think at that time they had enough rock in the state to build an entire building out of. So the state capitol of Georgia is built out of Indiana limestone. Uh, it does have a gold dome. There is, technically speaking, Georgia gold in the gold dome. Uh, there are only a couple of ounces of gold on the dome because it's spread out into gold leaf. But most of the gold on the Georgia go dome came from, uh, came from Brazil. Marble, of course, has been mined in Georgia. There are extensive mines there that are huge. Uh, the state, uh, the U.S. Capitol building is not made of marble, but the col uh, columns on the front of the building are. The Lincoln Monument itself is not the building, but the statue of Lincoln is Georgia marble. And of course, you could do the same for, for granite. But the money-making industrial mineral in Georgia is kaolin. It's a billion-dollar industry, uh, and it occurs uh, in this belt uh, you know, between uh, Augusta, Macon, and Columbus is a line called the Fall Line. Uh, that's where going north on a river, you encounter waterfalls because you encounter the crystalline, harder, more resistant bedrock. But um, you find a, a, a band of kaolin deposits right along the uh, front of the coastal plain. All right, let's start looking at minerals, uh, and uh, we'll go through uh, these uh, Almadine Garnet, uh, 
All of the garnets in Georgia are found, uh, of course, in the crystalline rock. This is a trapezohedron of uh, almondine uh, found in Union County, which is in the far northeast corner of the state. Uh, this is about uh, an inch and a half tall. Uh, this is about as good as the crystals of Georgia uh, of garnet get. Uh, most of the garnets in Georgia look like this. Um, they're not that spectacular. Um, there's another trapezohedron. Uh, this one I love because you've got a garnet crystal, sort of barely make out the faces, but it's got a starlight crystal in the middle of it. So you've got starlight and garnet growing in the same spot. Uh, this garnet here is pretty good for Georgia, but the thing that's cool about that is it's about five inches in diameter. It's a huge garnet. Starlight is the state mineral. Uh, the two on the right are from my personal collection. Uh, starlight is a monoclinic crystal. It grows in a uh, bladed crystal like this. It can twin uh, at 60 degrees or at 90 degrees. These are nicknamed fairy crosses. Uh, you can have complex uh, multiple twins like, uh, like the one on the far right. Or uh, weirdly shaped twins. These are the 60 degree twins or uh, complex twins. And these are all from a narrow band uh, in uh, the Blue Ridge of North Georgia. So and and to what degree have those samples been, been cleaned up, as it were? Is that how they come in situ? Um, sometimes they'll pop out um, in, you may notice a garnet there, but there is mica stuck to it. Um, and some people will take uh, buffing wheels and um, you know, wire brushes and clean them off, uh, remove some of the schist. Uh, and uh, some, some people will go too far and you'll actually see the scratches. Uh, I think I can see some scratches here from prepping, over prepping this, uh, but uh, very rarely do they pop out this clean. Um, and that's um, a very fortuitous, you got a good solid uh, starlight with very few inclusions, it will separate from the matrix. But when you get these minerals growing in a schist, um, it's a good question. It's very hard for to separate them from, from the matrix. But uh, kyanite is another metamorphic indicator mineral. Uh, it's found in a number of places. This is found actually uh, close to Macon, just a little bit north of Macon, which is pretty far south for a, a good metamorphic mineral. Uh, kyanite, of course, is almost usually distinctive blue. Uh, and the kyanite from this location has these kinks. The, the crystal, you know, formed and then got caught up in a later uh, mountain building episode in, and was uh, refolded into that kinky uh, kyanite. Uh, also in a band actually from Atlanta up to northeast Georgia and continuing into North Carolina uh, is a band of corundum. Corundum is the group name for uh, the varieties. Uh, you're more familiar with the varietal names of corundum. Uh, the red variety is ruby, uh, and any other color is sapphire. So it would be correct to call this mineral a sapphire. Uh, these are incredibly nice uh, sapphire crystals for uh, coming from Georgia. Uh, and um, so that's several inches uh, high. Uh, uh, very, very nice crystals. And Rutiel, uh, uh, found also in North Georgia, there's another famous locality we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this is a cyclic twin. Uh, so you'll see uh, one crystal uh, kink, uh, twinned here and twinned again. Uh, and this is a very nice crystal from Habersham County, again, in Northeast Georgia. Okay, we're gonna talk about quartz for a little while. Quartz is found all over the state. This is smoky quartz from Northeast Georgia. Uh, Georgia is probably most famous for amethyst, but uh, we're going to talk first about amethyst from a location in Towns County, straight north central Georgia. Uh, that crystal cluster on the left is about uh, 12 inches uh, front to back. So it's a large uh, crystal. All of the amethyst in Georgia that I've seen has all of the color concentrated in the tips and not in the, uh, in the prismatic uh, body of the crystal. So there's some zoning of the color that's common to Georgia. Uh, the Benny Ray Farm uh, in Buckhead, uh, Georgia, not 
Buckhead, the city, not the neighborhood in downtown Atlanta. If you're familiar with Atlanta, um, is a famous uh, amethyst locality. But the uh, real famous, uh, most famous uh, locality is Jackson's Crossroads. Uh, this photo was taken in the 1980s when I started collecting there, and it was all, all the collecting was done by hand. I mentioned the vegetation in Georgia. This is a tree farm. Uh, so a paper company uh, grows trees on the property as a crop. They, they harvest the trees. Somebody went out and found a site that was promising for amethyst. Uh, they started to dig there uh, and uh, got permission, and they could dig as long as they didn't disturb the trees. Uh, they did the best they could for a while, but they eventually ended up getting uh, forming a partnership and buying uh, the property. And uh, this was taken uh, in probably uh, 10 years ago or so. This is Terry Ledford, who for a time owned the mine, uh, and that's what it looks like uh, pretty much today. That's what the amethyst looks like after it's found. It uh, comes out of a granite, a highly weathered, altered granite. And uh, the crystals are covered with clay. You just wash the clay off. And this is what the specimens look like. That crystal is about two inches tall. So did these crystals form when the granite formed or did they form afterwards? It's a later generation. You have fractures in the granite in um, the... Um, um, solutions will redeposit quartz as amethyst in uh, in those cracks and cavities. Uh, this is, uh, of course, it's gem quality. This is a 98 carat stone, uh, very beautiful stone. I went collecting there one day, and you know, I I know that I'm going to find amethyst uh, if I if I were to go there, but. Uh, Terry Ledford told me that on one part, uh, they were finding calcite, and I thought that was interesting. So I went over and looked at the calcite, and of course, I have microscopes, so I um, looked at it, and I found the, the calcite crystals. They have, you know, it, it was near the surface, so there's all kinds of stuff growing on, on it, but there were these white balls. Uh, I had them analyzed, and they turned out to be a uh, rare earth carbonate that I had never heard of, locaite. Uh, locaite Y, uh, so it's abundant in yttrium. Uh, turns out that's the only occurrence of that mineral, not just in Georgia, but in the United States, and only the third occurrence of that mineral in North America. So that was a cool find. Uh, and uh, so uh, hydroxyl apatite, uh, we're jumping to a different location. Uh, there's a serpentinite uh, near north of Atlanta in which they find talc. And Hydroxyl apatite. This hydroxyl apatite is well crystallized and used as a standard around the world by people researching on phosphates. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's as good as it gets. Uh, it's, it's a metamorphic mineral, not well crystallized, but you can see a few faces of the hexagonal crystal there. Uh, there are a number of pigmentites around the state. Pigmentite forms these giant crystals. Uh, uh, it's the, something that forms generally in the last stages of granite uh, crystallizing. But in this case, this is formed by fluids being squeezed out of a metamorphic rock. So this is a different environment forming uh, the pigmentite. Uh, it, these pigmentites were mined for beryllium, for beryl. Uh, for scale, that uh, base that the beryl crystal is on is 12 inches across. This uh, muscovite crystal is also about a foot across, and this tourmaline crystal is two and a half feet uh, across. Uh, it's a really ugly tourmaline crystal. It's covered. It's actually altered, uh, altering to uh, to sericite, which is um, a retrograde muscovite alteration. Uh, here you see a tourmaline crystal from the Cochrane mine, and it's actually. Uh, retrograde, it's like a disease. It just uh, begins attacking the crystal and forming sericite, uh, muscovite mica uh, here. And there's a very sharp line where the alterations stop. Uh, another famous pigmentite in Georgia is the hog mine uh, in west central uh, Georgia. They find gem quality uh, aquamarine and rose quartz there. Uh, and somebody, uh, Shorl, is uh, a black member of the uh, tourmaline uh, group. 
And uh, somebody even faceted that, uh, even though it's uh, opaque. Georgia is also famous for barite. Uh, and this is the Paga mine in Cartersville, which is just a few miles south of Palace Science Museum. Uh, here uh, we are digging. This is a rock hound, Opal, uh, who went along on a trip, uh, collecting trip there. Uh, and uh, we were digging pretty far back into this hillside, and that's what the crystals look like when they come out of the ground. And this is what they look like when they're cleaned up. Uh, this specimen is about 10 inches across. This is in the TELUS uh, collection. Uh, this was in a private collection, a uh, beautiful barite crystal. Also found in, in these same mines are manganese oxides, which normally are not collectible. Um, except uh, this one is about 10 inches across, uh, but this was in the Tellus Museum collection and it had been sliced and polished. And it has this betroidal habit, but if you slice a betroidal habit, uh, you get the inside and you get the, like the inside of a cauliflower or something. It's, you know, it's uh, really beautiful. Some aragonite forms there uh, in the area, uh, gertite and iron oxyhydroxide. Uh, also in the area. Uh, in the far northeast, we have a couple of exceptions. We have good uh, calcite that was found, a one-time occurrence in a limestone quarry there. This specimen is about uh, over two feet tall. Those crystals are uh, zooming in. Those crystals are about two inches tall. So this is a large crystal, uh, a very nice specimen. Um, these are enormous calcite crystals that were found in the marble mines uh, near Tate uh, in north central Georgia. Uh, these crystals are about eight inches on an edge. The crystals are. This is an enormous specimen. And occasionally you'll get nice, uh, nice specimens of, uh, of calcite also in cavities from the, the marble mines. I'm going to um, we're not even going to get to gold uh, because of our time constraints, but I do have to talk about Graves Mountain, which is Georgia's probably Georgia's most famous location. Not much of a mountain. It was a mountain here at one time, but it was all quarried away uh, for kyanite. Uh, this is in a metamorphosed uh, crystal tuff that was altered and then metamorphosed. And so there's a lot of kyanite there and some other fantastically highly sought after minerals. This shows the Carolina uh, slate belt or Carolina terrain. Graves Mountain is at the southern end of that, uh, and it was mined for these aluminosilicates for um, uh, for ceramics. But there are some interesting, uh, uh, beautiful crystals. It's famous for lazulite, especially for the rutile and iridescent hematite. The rock in which the rutile occurs looks like this. You see the bladed uh, kyanite uh, that has been coated with the iridescent hematite, rutile crystals, and even quartz crystals here. Uh, this is a rare untwinned rutile crystal. Uh, it's about a centimeter across, and there are just two views of it. A uh, nice tetragonal crystal. Beautiful, uh, incredibly nice uh, lazulite. Some of the best in the world uh, comes from this mine. Uh, a lot of collectors are finding tons of iridescent hematite right now. Uh, some of the ugliest quartz crystals in Georgia come out of Grace Mountain, but they're made cool by being later coated with iridescent hematite. The lazulite uh, has altered, uh, and uh, you find a lot of secondary phosphate minerals. Uh, this is vericite and aluminum phosphate hydrate. And you see the shape of a lazulite crystal here, but it's been altered and uh, uh, a uh, vericite crystal grew in its place. The red blebs inside the crystal are actually microscopic thermally, or thermally, that would be nice, uh, rutile. Uh, the gold or brassy things are pyrite, which leads to acid mine runoff uh, here. But here's another crystal. And another rare phosphate. What was the scale the of house. those images? What's that? What was the scale of those images? Are you, are you um, looking these, at a microscope? This, uh, this crystal is less than a millimeter. So from okay. here to about here is a millimeter. 
And this one, I don't have a scale, but this would be uh, probably half a millimeter across. These are very tiny. And I'll, I'll just stop with uh, a list of minerals that occur at this mine. So this is one of the most prolific sites in Georgia. There, there are many others uh, that we uh, did not give any, uh, did not cover. Uh, of course, the gold uh, in Georgia uh, occurs in many places, but we're not going to talk about that today. So I'll just wrap up there and I'll take any questions. Oh, we'll have to have you back for another <laughs> another another presentation, uh, Julia, and that was fascinating and mind-blowingly beautiful. And it reminds me how sort of narrow my view of the mineralogical world is in this sort of younger part of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's our hour for the recording. So we're going to have time for Q&A, and I will have Gary turn off the recording.